So there is a portfolio you can have, which is natural resource oriented that will uh, do well, even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with macro analyst and currency expert, James Rickards. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Jim in which he explains why he expects a painful recession ahead this year, which will see stocks fall by as much as 30 to 50%, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthian and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Jim also kindly shares his thoughts on what sort of portfolio allocation should help the individual investor weather what's coming. So be sure to stick around to hear that. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Jim Rickards. What do you think is, is, a, is a rational allocation right now for somebody who's at, at, at first and foremost trying not to get destroyed this year? Yeah, and to be clear, I don't give personal financial advice, but at a macro level, I'm happy to talk about what- Absolutely, what, none of this is personal financial optimal, advice. Uh, Definitely uh, talk with an advisor, and I'm gonna make that plug at the end here yeah. too. <laughs> uh, portfolio might, might look like. Um, the first thing I say, diversification, the math and the science behind diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear. That's not much debate about that. The problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is, yours, you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will do, that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies, uh, and not just gold, gold, yeah, but um, I recently invested in a lithium mine. Uh, I think, I think, I think the the climate alarmists. I think the, I, I, the Green New Deal. I call it the Green New Scam, uh, and it's a scam. But it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs. Whether it's whether you like it or not, the fact is uh, it's going to go on. So the lithium's in short supply, uh, graphite, you know, et cetera. So there is a portfolio you can have, which is natural resource oriented, that will uh, do well, even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about. Slug of cash, absolutely, maybe as much as 30%. I like treasury notes, 10-year uh, treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If, it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five-year notes, two-year notes. They're going to come down a lot, not right away, not tomorrow morning, but um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is uh, you know, a recession and interest rates will follow or lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Um, uh, gold, I always recommend a 10% slice. Um, hey, hey, Jim, real, real quick, before we move on from bonds there. Um, so I've talked to a number of analysts and investors, you know, on this program recently, who have who have echoed what you just said there about bonds. And, you know, there are two really good reasons to hold them, right? three really good reasons to hold them right now. Um, one is just safety, right? This is a time to prioritize safety. Two, they're paying a lot more than they used to pay. So you're getting paid to sit in safety, which is nice. But then they have that that option value, right? Where if 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 the um, Fed does pivot and rates come down, um, yields come down, uh, the actual underlying price of the bond would go up. Right. And so uh, a number of these guys have said, you know, the bonds, particularly the the sovereign bonds, especially the U.S. Treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while, and and you know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious, does, do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a, I hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO1. DBO1 is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously basic bond math, interest rates come down, the value, the price of the bond goes up. They're just, invert. it's a little counterintuitive, but rates come down, the bond goes up. The question is how much? And the lower the interest rate, the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're going to have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher 
In other words, the DBO1 is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive. Right. But, but it's sort of like a Richter scale. Each new increment is a much the, higher magnitude. The, 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 the lower the rate, uh, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. Yep. That's the basically. So yeah, when you're, you are you go from 3% to 2%, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity. And if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt, but I just thought that was a really important point to underscore. Yeah, I, I agree with the analysts who are saying that. Uh, absolutely. Okay, great. So on to gold, you were saying eh, 10%-ish. Was 10%, what you, but, what you, you know, but, yeah, but based on what we were talking about, get um, I I would get uh, silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, the monster box, uh, you know, a bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mint, treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. Um, they'll feed your family for, you know, probably a year. And uh, it uh, um, they run, you know, it's, it's a market price, but, uh, you know, be around ten twelve thousand dollars $12,000 for a monster box. But to me, it's like, battery and flashlights you know just have one sticking in a safe place all right great and i'm curious do you have any uh particular thoughts on silver versus gold right now in your your 2023 yeah. outlook yeah I, I like them both and you know i talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and uh, i do the monetary analysis uh i mean i do invest in gold mines but i don't hold myself out as a geologist but i do think about it from a monetary perspective and then people always say jim what about silver what about silver I'm like look if, if gold soars the way i expect silver's along for the ride there's there's no there's not going to be a world of three thousand dollar gold and twenty dollar silver that world doesn't exist if gold's at three thousand silver is going to be pushing 100. So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the even the court, even the eight gram coin I mentioned, the quarter ounce American gold eagle, still five hundred bucks. It's like pulling a five hundred dollar bill out of your wallet. You know, it's it's a lot for groceries. Right. So 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 the think of the gold more as sort of the store of value and silver more as the the currency. Yeah, but the quarter ounce, you know, maybe uh, ten of them gets you a new car or something. So yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, for bigger purchases. But yeah. Okay, great. So that's gold. I I know in the past you've you've said, hey, you know, real estate, private equity, farmland, et cetera, those are all things to consider as well. Yeah, um, I think it, gold... yeah, yeah, income producing real estate. I wouldn't get into commercial real estate, residential. Uh yeah, the, the prices are, you know, um home prices are coming down uh a little more in some markets than others. But uh if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a in a place like, you know. Uh, someplace people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know there 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but you know, it's like buying a, a 10 year bond, you know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland, uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. All right. Great. Um, I got one last topic uh, I want to talk about with you before I do anything else, just sort of on uh Actually, let me ask this. So um, we talked there about sort of diversification largely with the eye towards sort of making it through what's coming here. Are there any areas that you potentially think are like, hey, get, given the events that we see coming, yes, while they're a little scary, there's some opportunity maybe to really, if you, if you have some speculative capital, this could be a place that you think could pop really well. Yeah, I mean, I like uh, I, I like private equity, and it's you know you got accredited investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But um, you know that, that there are some uh, you know some good deals in the mining sector. Um, I like, uh, and um, um, well, that, that 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 would be one. I mean, we haven't we haven't really talked about the important things going on, but we'll maybe do that in another interview. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and hey, well, on no, that so, ser seriously, everything we talked about is sort of pales in comparison to what's going on in Ukraine. We're kind of on a march toward nuclear war, but maybe we'll talk about that 
some other interview. Yeah, you know, I that, that honestly was the question I had before we got to the allocation here, and I just thought it was such a great big topic that I didn't want to give it too short shrift. But if you're if you're willing to come back on, Jim, would love to really dive into that with you because you're right. I mean, that's you know, if if we're not around here anymore for a smoking pile of rubble, nothing none of what we talked about matters. Right. Um, all right. Um, well, look, uh, t- two quick things. One is on uh, the private equity uh, side of things. I've actually been talking to um, some companies that give access to private equity to the regular retail investors, some interesting new models coming out there. Um, there are also, as you know, Jim, you mentioned a little bit, you know, there, there are some um, companies that will sometimes approach me and say, hey, we've got an interesting, you know, deal coming up. If you know anyone who's interested in, in participating, let us know. Um, folks, if you're interested in learning more about private equity and the potential opportunities to invest in there as a retail investor, let me know in the comments section below. If there's enough interest, um, I'll definitely prioritize some of those interviews. Um, all right, Jim, as, as we wrap up here, um, I want to just talk to you real quickly about um, the current state of media. Um, I, I, I believe you and I share the opinion that there's just a need out there for more trustworthy media. And honestly, I think this is why newsletters like yours and, and programs like Wealthion are seeing the success they're seeing recently is because people are just so disaffected with uh, the quality um, or, or the quality debasement uh, that's been going on in you know the, the establishment or the mainstream media world. Um, uh, you know, it, and what's interesting is it seems like that business model is breaking. Like even the billionaires are getting out, right? Jeff Bezos just basically said he's selling his stake in uh, in the Washington Post here. So um, it doesn't seem to be serving anybody these days, not not the populace and not even the people that, that own these things. So I, I just love to hear your thoughts on this because I, I know this is something that you care about, that you've written about a bit. Um, and uh and you're playing a role in trying to give people, you know, more accurate, more nutritious, more actionable information than than what they're able to get from the new sources that they're just directed to by society. Yeah, um, if you talk about what they call legacy media, mainstream media, so Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, right. CNN, that run of characters. The first thing you discover is I know a lot of these people. I've been on all these programs. I've done this for a long time. I spent a lot of time in Washington. I had dinner with most of the, or lunch or whatever, dinner actually more often with most of the names you've heard about. Um, some of them are fine. Some of them are nice. A lot of them are either not that bright or, I mean, they're good on camera they need, uh, or whatever. They got a desk at the Washington Post. They're not that bright. Or if they've got some degrees, they've been kind of indoctrinated. We're at the point now. Uh, I mean, a lot of these people are 28, 33, 34 years old. There's nothing wrong with that. That's you know good. You're you're in the heart of your career, but that means they graduated from school in uh, you know 2016, 2017, or whatever, um, and they're thoroughly indoctrinated. Uh, I'm, I I um, I mean, I went to school when uh, uh, we learned, we learned it was pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I had one program where. The they graded you needed a C plus average to graduate, I mean, but they graded on a C minus curve. So you're like, well, how do you get it? How do you how do you even get a C plus if they're grading on a C minus curve? And the answer is people quit. And in, the, in other words, you were you were trying to struggle to be. I did get an A in partnership taxation. I'm proud of that. But my the standards are down. The mission standards are down. Affirmative action takes over. When you get into the classroom, I don't care where you're at. You know, Ivy League, whatever. It's just indoctrination. The market has a way of sorting it out. I mean, if revenues are down, advertising is down, the viewers are down, subscriptions are down. Eventually, as you said, they will go out of business, not overnight. And then new media channels will arise. And, you know, there's a lot of garbage on the Internet, but there's a lot of good stuff. And, um, you know, if you want to keep tabs on the war in Ukraine, you have to know where to look. It's not easy, but there are a number of channels with and I'm talking about, you know, military officers, you know, colonels you know, brigadier generals, um, people on the ground in Ukraine, not, you know, some studio in New York, you can find out what's going on. But I think my intelligence training is helpful because you have to be very persistent and know how to dig. And know where to look. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's really interesting. So in some ways, this is almost the opposite of what's going on with with CBDCs, where they're trying to get the pigs into the chute, where it seems like the pigs are escaping here on the uh on the media front right where they're, they're the establishment sort of trying to ring fence okay you know these are the narratives that we all support and we're all gonna you know echo yep. together 
and people are just saying it's not working for him anymore and and that's why you're seeing you know um proliferation of the sites that you just talked about you know i've talked to to matt taibbi about this and he's yep. a great example of a, of a journalist who kind of went from a mainstream brand and just hung an independent shingle and has been crushing it um yeah there's matt matt taibbi uh, barry weiss um uh, Greg greenwald yeah Greg Green, uh, uh yeah, uh, I was trying Dylan to think of uh, oh, uh, Alex Berenson on COVID. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of good reporting out there, but you won't find it in the Washington Post. Uh, all right. Well, look, where I was going with all this, Jim, is, you know, for people who are seeking out great sources um, of information um, that gives them a more accurate sense of what's going on and a more useful and practical sense of what's going on than what they're getting on those big broadcast channels or those big newspapers um, is, um, you know, I mentioned a couple of times here, but you've got a phenomenal newsletter that people can sign up for for free. Uh, as you said, they can get access to your your past uh, archive of, of all your information. Um, and uh, you've got a lot of, um, I think, you know, I, I know that there's sort of one campaign going on there right now uh, that's been, just from what I've been hearing about, incredibly successful, incredibly popular. So um, I want to reiterate for folks that, that if they've really enjoyed this conversation with you and they want to follow you in your work, is a very easy way to do that. And they should just go to Wealthion dot com slash records and they'll be sent directly to your newsletter they can learn all about it sign up for it if they're interested um and just want to give you a chance to say anything else about what you offer through that service um well we have a number of publications we have um uh, our flagship publication is called strategic intelligence um i don't want to quote a price because it, it it but it's it's very modest uh and it's uh, 12 issues a year once a month but we put a ton of work into it i do 5,000 words or so, which is, you know, 60,000 words a year. So that's a book. Uh, and, but we have other contributors, really good ones, Dan Amos, Byron King, um, and, and, uh, and others. So that's, uh, that's a great entry level, but you, you get a lot for the money. And then we have specialized services, they're more expensive, but we have specific recommendations and strategies and, uh, you know, people can, uh, you know, take those and use them or not, that's up to them, but they'll get very good information and good analysis. Um, but we, uh, it's not just, but we we range broadly. We'll do China, we'll do Ukraine, we'll do Russia, we'll do energy, we'll do a lot of macro themes that will they do affect markets, and you'll get some good advice. But that's um, yeah, that's that's kind of what we do. And then the other uh, venue um, that is free is uh, my my Twitter account at James G Rickards. I use my middle initial for that, James G R I C K A R D S, one word. But that's uh, um, uh, you know, if I'm giving a speech or write an article, or sometimes I, you know, move for Philadelphia sports teams, whatever. But, uh, but there's, a, there's a there's a ton of information there, and that's uh, that is free. I, I totally agree, Jim. When we edit this, we'll put up the links there, both to the your newsletter and to your Twitter handle. And and I like to share with folks, you know, when a guest is one of the folks I follow on Twitter, you're definitely one of the guys I follow on Twitter every day. Um, all right. Well, Jim, thanks so much for giving us so much of your time. It's always wonderful to have you on the program. Look forward to having you back on again in the future, both to call audibles as we get further into 2023, but we'd love to have you back on as well to talk about that extremely important topic and theme that we, we didn't get a chance to address in this video. Good. Thanks, Adam. All right. Well, now's the time on the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed financial advisory firms by Wealthion. Um, I'm feeling very sheepish because we took a first crack at this and I didn't have the recording on. So John and Mike very kindly agreed to stay late and re-record this with me. Um, guys, thanks so much for your tolerance there. Well, let's jump right in. Jim had an awful lot to say. Um, and the day we're speaking, guys, uh, right after we finish up here, we're going to find out what uh, Jerome Powell's you know, latest uh, policy decision is. Um, sadly, we don't have that insight for this conversation, um, but next time you guys are on, we'll totally deconstruct that. Um, John, real quick, what were some of your top takeaways here from Jim? Adam, this gives us a great opportunity to get right to the point, uh, the key <laughs> takeaways. Um, well, yeah, it is Fed Day, and of course, the world hangs in wait every time the Fed is is going to talk because they've been such an influence on markets these last uh, decade plus. Um, you know, cutting right to this chase, Jim, Jim thinks the Fed has been talking tough for good reason, that they're not bluffing, that the stock market seems to be wanting to call a bluff that they're likely not making. Again, we'll we'll find out really soon enough how how tough they they still want to be in terms of interest rate increases. Um, we 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 frankly think they they don't have the the leeway to 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 let down off of that tough talk. Uh, so we think there probably will be some. We don't think a pivot uh, in terms of uh, lowering interest rates is anywhere in the near future unless something 
dramatically breaks. But um, you know, to Jim's kind of key point, uh, he he emphasizes that this market, uh, the stock market, and we'll talk about the U.S. stock market, um, has probably tremendous more downside to go, uh, irrespective of soft landing, hard landing, or whatever. We have valuations that are still uh, tremendously high on par with the uh, broad uh, peak valuations of the tech bubble of 2000. Uh, and going back to 1929, the sell-off in the stock market last year did uh, all it did was take the the real frothy froth out of what would still be considered a very richly valued market. Now there have been opportunities that have, have emerged, and, and Jim talked about some areas that he he thinks are timely, as as do we, and we'll probably get into that in a bit. But putting point on it, he thinks the stock market has probably got 30 to 50 percent uh, downside likely in it, and we don't think those are. Uh, off the mark at all. Um, we think that's uh, very much uh, a, a possible, if not likely, scenario given where valuations are and, and the head, the bunch of headwinds that we're seeing with with inflation and interest rate policy and whatnot. All right, yeah, and that um, you know that caught my attention as well, right? You know, this this is not a little market dip that he's talking about. You know, everybody thought that the twenty percent uh, that we saw in twenty twenty, you know, was a mortal wound. Um, Jim's talking about something much more substantial. Um, and that's on top of, you know, what already happened last year. Um, all right, Mike, well, coming to you, um, I want to get to Jim's uh, sort of recommended uh, portfolio allocation in just a second, but anything else to pile on top of what John just mentioned? Yeah, basically, Jim ca cautions for people to prepare now. Prepare now by reducing equity allocation. Uh, prepare now by raising cash so that you can buy things more inexpensively in the future. Hopefully, that could be either stock market assets or it could be, it could be real estate. It could be any number of things. But prepare now is the message, you know. And, and he says, don't don't be waiting for the pivot. The Fed's not going to pivot until they break something. If the Fed pivots, it means that they messed up. And the Fed is, I'm sure, probably very afraid of messing up. We're going to find out what they're. They did this month in about 15 minutes. It's about quarter to two Eastern here uh, on the Wednesday Fed day. We'll find out. It's probably going to be 0.25% or 25 basis points increase, you know, with some language about being, you know, vigilant about inflation, that kind of thing. It's all politics. And honestly, it doesn't even really, it doesn't, it's not worth even trying to guess anymore. You know, they're going to keep trying to glide this ship down. Gradually, but we're in a very almost hideous overvaluation state, a very dangerous place, and it's not easy to get from here to there in a perfect path. So um, prepare now, raise cash, easily could be 50% lower than here, and that's not even counting an overshoot to the downside. Last thing I'd point out is the inverted yield curve. I learned something a little bit new here and that I wasn't looking at German bonds lately, but... Uh, Jim says that even the German bond market, which is their German bonds, sovereign bonds is inverted now as well, which is quite rare. And so globally, we have an inverted yield curve. All the major uh, financial superpowers are inverted. So it's a strong, strong warning indicator. Don't believe the contrarian wisdom that says, well, everyone's predicting a recession, so it can't happen. A lot of people were predicting big up markets in the in the latter part of the last decade, and that that happened. Everyone was predicting it, and and frankly, it happened. Um, it, just pay attention to the valuations and the market internals, which are negative, and uh, and be cautious. All right. Well, well, well said. Um, you know, to your your comment there about the um, inverted yield curves, which are one of the best indicators we have of coming recession in the data series. Uh, there's another one I want to put up real quickly that's from a recent interview I did with um, Alf Pecatiello. Um, and this is the um, conference board uh, top 10 uh, leading economic indicators. And this particular data series has a 100% correlation um, with um, you know, if it if it declines, that means we're we're entering into recession. Well, it's declining now, folks. Um, so it's it's screaming that there's a recession ahead. So you know, it's so interesting. Jim was talking about the three um, uh, storytellers, right? The Fed, the markets, uh, and and reality. And if we just keep looking at uh, you know reality as best we can define it, which is looking at all of our data series. The vast preponderance of the macro data series just look terrible. <laughs> they look bad and they're worsening. Um, <clears throat> so clearly the markets are ignoring that right now. Um, and even the Fed is trying to you know, get out there and get the markets to become a little bit more um, 
uh, a little bit less enthusiastic, you know, as we we've said before, uh, the um, the financial conditions um, are looser today than they were when the Fed began its its campaign of rate hikes and, and QT back in March of last year. So that's exactly not what the, what the Fed wants to have happen here, right? So it's going to be very interesting to learn whatever Jerome Powell and the Fed announced in the next fifteen minutes or so. Um, but um, it's it's it's. I will say it's going to be hard for me not to see them trying to take as tough a stance as possible um, because the animal spirits of the market are, are right now just can completely ignoring uh, what the the central planners are, are are trying to guide them to. And and part of me is sort of you know rooting for the Fed here that that they're bringing some much needed um, sobriety to the situation here. But part of me also has a ton of schadenfreude because this is a monster these guys created. You know, I'm like, yeah, of course it's hard to get under control. You've been training this market for practically 15 years, you know, that you're always going to step in and save it. So, John, I see you nodding here. Yep, yep. Um, it, it's, uh, it's it's pretty crazy uh, where we are. Uh, we got to this point, and, and I, I think the, the markets are uh, in denial, but... Uh, uh, you know, I, I too like that analogy of the three uh, three Irishmen in the pub, uh, each having their own story. I think you said by May, uh, the story is going to be clear and, and the debate will be over. You know, we're we're not quite in the, the business of calling specific dates, but that would not surprise us. You know, we think. Right. Uh, and just to clarify, when you said the story is going to be clear, he was saying reality is going to have one yes. out. And, and this recession is not going to be a debate anymore, whether we're going to have yes. one or a soft or hard landing. He's th he's saying the hard landing is going to be clear to everybody starting around then. Yeah, we 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 think that's probably the case as well. Yeah, he talked. Uh, you know, getting to really, you know, the the point about uh, well, how do you how do you allocate assets today in this this market in, in light of what we've just touched upon? And you know, he he talked about the um, the buzzword of diversification. Our industry uh, has professed the benefits and the virtues of diversification for. For decades and the reality is is that most folks misunderstand what diversification is and what it means and our industry industry itself does you know because a standard uh portfolio in our industry is is diversified if it has you know hundreds of stocks or thousands of stocks and and you know 20 different bond funds but you're still in basically two broad asset classes stocks and bonds and and uh you know, when when things, especially in a, a monetary uh, policy induced bubble like we've had over the last uh, growing over the last decade, where manipulated interest rates lower have caused all assets, including bonds and stocks to to rise to unnatural levels. Um, you know, the diversification benefits of those two broad asset classes uh, no longer are are, are helpful uh, because they become highly correlated in 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 major sell-offs uh most in, in any kind of recent shocks we've seen you know the you've seen broad asset classes of, of stocks and bonds sell off and in, in, in together and um you know when he speaks of diversification uh he, he talks about truly different asset classes uh and, and this is getting to his his uh, uh favorite areas right here and now and we agree with this uh he, he likes natural resources uh, as a as a class energy, um, you know, broad-based uh, commodities, uh, base metals, agricultural, pro you know, commodities, uh, you know, those are a, a diversified asset class. And, 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 and most, most traditional uh, asset allocation uh, programs would only put a token two or 3% into that asset class. So, so hardly a, a dose of that. Um, he likes precious metals, uh, gold and silver. Um, you know, he thinks about gold as, you know, uh, ten percent of a, a one's portfolio is almost a necessity. We we agree with that. We think it's a very important uh, diversifier, uh, insurance policy, even against you know monetary policies that have kind of run amok. And uh, you know, things like gold mining stocks, we think are are very undervalued. Um, he he advocates holding a bunch of cash. We do too. Uh, he th he thinks thirty percent or more. We're closer to forty percent for for most of our clients. Um, we think that cash is a great place to be right now. It's it's. Uh, uh, as long as it's held in things like short-term treasury bills, something very safe and liquid that's earning a competitive yield, um, that that presents not only safety and security and liquidity, but the opportunity to pivot from from those safe holdings into other things like stocks and and other types of things uh, when they're more attractively priced. Which broadly speaking, they're not right now. Um, and he talked about um, you know longer-term treasury bonds that that uh, if we do if we are heading towards that kind of recessionary environment likely see yields on those longer longer term bonds come down and the prices of those those bonds increase we agree we do have a tactical allocation to longer term treasury bonds that 
We're certainly not advocating advocating folks buying 20 or 30 year treasury bonds right now and holding them forever. We think it's a more of a shorter term tactical trade. And I'll just wrap up. He talks about other non-correlated assets like um, income producing real estate. Um, we agree real assets, real estate is a form of real assets is, is probably a good place to be provided you, you pay a fair price. Anything that's richly overvalued is likely to going to real estate included, um, likely going to be a poor investment. Uh, you got to make sure you buy it at an at a attractive value that can support the cash flow that are inherent in the assets. Um, I think I covered most of the bases there, but uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting time ahead here. And we're uh, we're prepared to be nimble and, and observant for our clients. Great. I just want to mention two other classes that, that uh, asset classes that Jim mentioned there. One was farmland, one was um, private equity. Um, we've got a farmland uh, expert uh, coming up soon, which I'll mention in just a second. Um, and on the private equity side, that's been a very um, uh, elusive asset, I would say, for the asset class, for the, the regular investor. Um, they, they don't have easy access to it, and most don't even know what it is. Um, when we say private equity, what exactly do we mean? Um, <clears throat> just to let folks know, um, behind the scenes, I've been working on um, you know, potentially uh, bringing in some experts on private equity. There have been some really interesting solutions uh, in that space over the past couple of years where new technologies and new regulations are making that asset class finally more accessible to the average investor. Um, and uh, there might be some interesting ways uh, for the wealthy and audience to play in that space in the future. Um, so um, anyways, it's, it's, I've got nothing to announce. I'm still exploring this stuff. But if, if there's interest in learning more about what private equity is, how it works, and how a regular investor might be able to add it into their portfolio, um, especially to get the diversification that Jim's talking about, let me know in the comments section below. And if there's enough interest, I'll try to bump that a little bit higher on the priority list. Um, all right, guys, well, look, as we begin to get to the end of our time here, and I'm sorry, we're cutting a little bit short this week. That's totally on me with the recording. Um, uh, I do want to mention, let folks know that um, the uh, we just uh, sent out the first emails, letting folks know how they can sign up for the upcoming uh, Wealthion conference on March 18th. Uh, we do these conferences twice a year, so we're doing uh, our one for the first half of the year then. Uh, and we've got just a phenomenal faculty lined up for that. Um, just real quick, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so I'm sure I'm forgetting folks, but we've got Lacey Hunt, Mark Faber, uh, Michael Pento, Daniel DiMartino Booth, Stephanie Pomboy, um, Rick Rule, Doomberg, um, Craig Wishner, who is uh, a farmland investor, runs a farmland fund. Um, we're going to have uh, Mike Maloney, um, uh, Lucky Lopez just signed on. Um, uh, there's one or two other ones that I know I'm forgetting, and we're still adding a few more to the list. So, but as you can already see, it's a phenomenal group uh, of domain experts. And so, um, I'll be brief here. I'll, I'll, in a future video, I'll, I'll go into more depth on exactly what we're going to cover. But if you want to learn more about it and register for it, just go to wealthion.com/conference. Um, and if you're interested uh, and you think you're going to register, register soon because if you do now, you can lock in the lowest price, the early bird price. Um, all right. So um, guys, as we wrap up, uh, Mike, I'll let you have the last word here just in terms of, um, you know, I know you guys talk to people every day. Uh, and I think J January was a really big month for you guys. Um, you know, uh, to me, I take that as a sign that people are getting um, increasingly I don't know, concerned, anxious about kind of the cross currents of messages that they're getting right now. Um, so would you have any parting words of advice to these folks? Yeah, you know, it was a it was a very, very busy January. We're very grateful to, to have been that busy. It's a good thing. We talked to a lot of great people. Um, some of them became clients, and we're, we're extremely grateful for that. I'd say the tenor is a little bit different now and that the people that we've talked to recently have been more kind of um, you know, worried for longer, I think, or, or more in cash than they have been in the past. If this was a couple of years ago, like in 2021, um, there would have been more FOMO, fear of missing out, a little bit more fully invested. Now we're talking to people that have been out of the market or largely out of the market, sometimes for a year or longer. And they're like, I know this isn't right, but what the heck's going on here? You know, the market just is hanging in there. It's above 4,000 on the S&P and the market seems bulletproof. You know, we just had the best January in the NASDAQ since 2001 in 22 years. It doesn't That's make crazy. sense. Some of the biggest rallies are in bear markets. The job of this market is to psychologically pressure you into doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Part of what we offer to people is psychological support. 
I'll come right out and say is a big part of that. And, you know, and through our battle scars here at New Harbor, we can, I think, apply our experience and understand what people are going through. And so people are more worried. A lot of times they're more out of the market, but they're really looking for somebody to work with them or at least give them advice. And when we talk to somebody, it's not a sales pitch. Many, many people don't become clients. We're we're just interested in talking and connecting. That's our promise. They'll never hear a sales pitch from us uh, or any pressure. So a lot of times we're just chatting and giving them some good, honest feedback. But we enjoy all those conversations. They're all great and I always get something out of them. And, and, and when I talk to people, when we all talk to people, we hope they get at least one good thing out of the conversation. That happens a lot. But there's a lot of concern and a, and a lot of thinking about, OK, what's next? All right. Well, look, that, that was a great segue into my normal, hey, you know, go schedule a, a free consultation. Um, it's what we were just talking about there, where you guys talk to an awful lot of people, many of them don't actually become clients, but this is the public service that you and our other uh, endorsed advisory firms like like Lance Roberts's firm offer to folks, which is, you know, folks, if you're watching this and you are feeling overwhelmed, confused, uh, at sea, uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen next as you're trying to figure out how to preserve your your portfolio and your wealth. Um, schedule one of these free consultations. They don't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with the guys. It's just a free public service that they offer to try to help as many people as possible. Take prudent action today, should Jim be right and the things that he's predicting actually do happen on the timeline that he's talking about. So to go set up one of those free consultations, just go to wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. Um, all right. Well, look, um, folks, if you enjoyed this conversation with Jim, would like to, like to see Jim back on the program again sometime soon, um, do two things. One, um, be sure to go and sign up for Jim's excellent newsletter over at wealthion.com slash Rickards. Um, and then uh, if you want to see great guests like him again on the program too, please support this channel and hit the like button. And then click the red subscribe button below if you haven't already, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Uh, John and Mike, thanks so much for hanging with me again this week, twice since we had to re-record this a second time. Uh, I know you guys are going to run off and go see what the the, the Fed announcement is. I'm going to do that myself. Um, everybody else, we look forward to talking about it next week with John and Mike uh, and everyone who's watched this far in the video. Thanks so much for watching. Always enjoy it. Adam with you. We'll see you next week. Thanks again, Adam. Next week it will be. Take care. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.